Well, welcome to this uh, book salon, uh, organized by the Three City uh, and hosted by the Three City and by the Seminary Co-op. And we are here to discuss uh, Professor Francois Hartog's book, Kronos, The West Confronts Time. So what I'll do is um, just introduce Professor Hartog a bit uh, and the panelists here. And um, we have actually another panelist, Stefan Pamier from the Anthropology Department, who couldn't be here because he um, had, had some medical issues, but sent written comments. So uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll invite Professor Hartog to say a few words about the book first, and then, um, then we will um, invite our panelist to speak. Um, Sarah Nutter, my <coughs> colleague from Classics, Bill Brown, my colleague from the English Department, and Nitsan Levovich, who is visiting Jewish Studies program, the Greenberg professor, belongs to the History Department at Lehigh University. Um, it's been a great privilege um, that we have the eminent French historian Francois Hartog here to discuss with us one of his most recent books, Kronos, the West Confronts Time, which was published this year in English. The French edition came out in 2020 with Gallimard. Professor Hartog really does not need any introduction. He is one of the most prominent and creative thinkers today of historical time, um, and so in the world, I think. Um, one of his very recently and partly, very recently published and partly autobiographical books called A la Recontra de Chrono, which, is, which was published this year. In that book, he recounts how the problem of time and temporality, how these problems increasingly came to engage his attention uh, over decades, really. <coughs> He's the author of many books, of which the two very prominent ones in English translation are The Mirror of Herodotus, the representation of the other in the writing of history, which was first published in French in 1980, and then took a long time to be published in English in 1998. And, but you can also see that his books are getting <laughs> published quicker and quicker, which is another indication of how important he's becoming to the English language academy. The other book that actually many of us here have read, or at least heard about, is Regimes of Historicity which was published in English in 2015, in French in 2003. The growing appetite, as I said, in the English language academic world for his work may be seen in that, in that uh, acceleration. <laughs> it's part of the great acceleration <laughs> for the demand for his books in, in English. Um, professor Hartog <coughs> is Professor Emeritus at the EHEWS in Paris, the Institute for Advanced Studies, really. And he's visited this university on several occasions in the past, but three times to teach, once in anthropology. And then in 2016, he came to teach a course in, as part of social theory, and some of his students from that class I can see here. And um, this year, he's visiting us through the history department, but his visit, visit was made possible by the generosity of many academic programs and departments on campus, the History Department, the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization, the Committee on Social Thought, the Institute on the Formation of Knowledge, and last but not least, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory. I thank them all and thank uh, Anna Sell Jones, the Associate Director of the Center and her team uh, for organizing this book salon. So, as I said, what we'll do is begin with uh, Francois Yu, and my request to all of you is that if none of you sp spoke for more than 10 minutes, we will have plenty of time left for discussion. <laughs> okay, so Francois, we will begin with you saying a few words about the book. Is it up? Yeah, okay. First of all, I would like to thank 
the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore for having put this uh, event in their calendar. To thank warmly Anna Searle Jones for having organized it until the very last minute. To thank warmly to the colleagues which, who generously agreed to take on their time to be here this evening. Bill Brown, Nitsan Lebovic, Sarah Nutter, and my special thanks to, that's too, I'm too far away from the microphone. Yeah. And my special thanks to Stefan Palmier, who, because, as the Depeche said of LCCU, cannot be here with us tonight. And last but not least, my special thanks to Depeche, without whom nothing would have happened. <laughs> Kronos, the book, has something to do with Chicago for two reasons. As I explain, as I explained in a small book published two months ago, A la Rencontre de Kronos, one of the first readings that put me on the path of the notion of regime of historicity is Marshall Salin's Islands of History. Not only are these islands in history, but they are producers of their own form of history, which he called a rake. Much later, when I had the chance to come to Chicago, I met Marshall and got to talk, to talk with him. This small book is dedicated to him. The second reason has to do with Depeche. In 2016, we began a conversation that has not stopped since. He was working on the climate. The I was working on Kronos. He expanded my understanding of the modern regime of historicity and was my mentor in Anthropocene. So great is my gratitude. The goal of regimes of historicity was to try out the notion of the regime of historicity, demonstrating its heuristic potential to illuminate or better illuminate temporal crisis, those moments Anna Arendt called gaps, in which temporal signposts vanish and disorientation set in. After serving as a trusty signpost, the past suddenly slipped into darkness. And inversely, the future, always a demanding engine, abruptly, abruptly dodged out of view. When only the present seems to be available, when time has no reference point but itself, how is life or action thinkable? I proposed calling such a singular condition presentism. While the past had dominated the whole regime of historicity and the future had taken on the leading role under the new regime, during the presentist regime, only the pres present remained. No one would claim that presentism swept in every local and every social stratum overnight. But since the 1970s, the presentist tendency has been buttressed by the digital revolution, by the increased role of finance in the economy, and more broadly, by globalization. Capturing the texture of the present as accurately as possible was the explicit goal of the book, although the presentist present was still in its beginnings. In Kronos, I again turn to the regime of historicity. My goal remained the same, but my approach has changed. The inquiry opened this time with Christian time. The Christian regime of historicity presented at the beginning point of what eventually became Western time. 
where does it come from, what initially drove it forward. A different starting point, yes, and a different ending too. The beginning of the 21st century bears little resemblance to the end of the 20s. Presentist has not gone, presentism has not gone away, but it, na it, it is now thrown into question, and to borrow the phrase of Deepesh, a planetary age has appended all our temporal preconceptions. The matter begins with the Greeks. We divided time into Kronos and Kairos. The first is ordinary time, that of the season, the second is that of the unexpected, of the opportunity to be sized, of the favorable moment, and also of the decisive instant. Knowing how to mobilize the Kronos Kairos couple wisely, if the, mobilized wisely, is the guarantee of a successful action. To the first, this first couple, the Greeks added a second one of more limited scope the one formed by Kairos and Chrysis, which was used in particular by Hippocratic medicine. In the first sense, Chrysis means a judgment. Applying, applying the concept of Chrysis to an illness, it means designating the moment when it course, its course change, tilting toward the better or the worse. It's up to the doctor to know how to identify the critical days and at the same time, the favorable moment, Kairos, for an, an intervention on his part. Now, these three concepts passed from the Greek world to the world of the Bible, the day it was translated in Greek, into Greek. Then the writer of the New Testament took them up in their turn, not without modifying them. If Kronos remains ordinary time, Chrysis is given a much stronger meaning by coming to name the last judgment, or the day of the Lord. In Jewish apocalypse, the judgment that will divide the writers from the reprobate forever is preceded by the violent days of the apocalypse. The first Christian, a small Jewish apocalyptic sect, took up this scheme while profoundly transforming it since the Messiah had come. Finally, Kairos designates the moment of the incarnation. Christ, Christ is Kairos, or, or even the Kairos. He is the unique event that comes to cut into Kronos time, a radically new time. Time becomes Christocentric and will be more and more so until it makes Christ the pivot of world time. The result, the result of that what I say, its operation, is that Kronos is now squeezed between the two boundaries of the incarnation and the approaching judgment. Between the two, there is only a present without real history. For if all is not complete, not yet complete, all is already accomplished. It is necessary to convert and to be awake for the imminence of the end. And the rest of the story <laughs> is about the ways in which Kronos, escaping little by little from its two guardians, Kairos and Chrysis, took its autonomy and with the modern time extended its empire on the Western world and beyond. But with the 21st century, a new configuration is being put in place, that of a presentism that is both contested and reinforced and of an untry and into a planetary age. Tocqueville, returning from America, wrote in 1840, when the past no longer illuminates the future, the spirit walks in darkness. This diagnosis confirmed the end of the old regime of historicity and gave in the same movement the formula of the modern reversal, when the future, future enlightens the past and the present the spirit no longer walks in darkness. This new relation to time is at the foundation of the modern regime of historicity. However, with the entry into the Anthropocene, or the planetary age, in the space of a few years, 
the configuration changes again drastically. A light comes again from the future. The spirit should soon, therefore, no longer walk in darkness, except that this light is black. The structure that was that of the modern regime of historicity, where the future dominated and illuminated the present and the past, becomes operative again. Now, unlike the modern regime, which was completely our work, this renewed regime is only partly our work, insofar as the human species has become a geological force. And the future in progress, it will be better to do something to escape it, or failing that, to delay it. A double injunction is therefore exercised to believe again in the future, but in a future that is anything but radiant. This is anything but easy, easy, especially for those humans who for, for, for late, nearly two centuries were fed futurism before being caught up during the last half century by presentism. Thank you. So I invite Sarah to So can you hear me if I speak like this? You in the back? OK, thank you. <clears throat> Professor Hartog begins his book with a quote from Augustine. What then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I want to explain it to someone who asks me, I do not know. As Professor Hartog writes, Augustine seems to suggest here that time, or chronos, is fundamentally psychologically ungraspable or at least cannot be articulated through language. Later in the same passage, however, that is the same passage of the Confessions, Augustine adds the following. Take the two tenses, past and future. How can they be when the past is not now present and the future is not yet present? Perhaps it would be exact to say there are three times, a present of things past, a present of things present, and a present of things to come. In the soul, there are these three aspects of time, and I do not see them anywhere else. A similar attempt to untangle the strands of perceived time, not perhaps time itself, but from a historical angle, animates Professor Hartog's excellently thought-provoking book, Kronos, The West Confronts Time. Then the next few minutes, I will pick up on just a few strands of how he initially presents his trio of time terms, Kronos, Kairos, and Croesus, and pose a few questions that spring from these. So let me admit that I'm giving a lot of weight to the brief pre-Christian part of Professor Hartog's book, though most of the book concerns Christianity and the world thereafter. Um, but since I'm a classicist and Professor Hartog is also a classicist in origin, I hope he will indulge me. I, tell you, I burst him out of the closet. <clears throat> so Professor Hartog notes that the Greek word chronos has no known etymology. That is, we do not know from what root or original word this word springs. Uh, but that it sounds a lot like the name Kronos, that is the guy in Greek mythology who is the father to Zeus. So this is, in English, we would say K-R-O-N-O-S. Um, now, I don't think there's any meaningful semantic link between the two Kronoses, um, or at least there wasn't in ancient Greek times. But I do think that Professor Hartog's focus on the myth of Kronos, the father of Zeus, bears mentioning. So as he sums it up in the book, Kronos, the son of Uranus and Gaia, famously castrated his father. Having thereby come to power, he read uh, Rhea, taking care to devour his children as soon as they were born to stave off the possibility that one might topple him from power. The outcome of the story is well known. By subjecting Kronos to the same fate he had, he had reserved for his father, Zeus came to rule over gods and humans. So what we have here is a configuration of Greek time is endless repetition. One dad tries to arrest time by swallowing his children, but the child nonetheless pushes time forward by doing violence to his own dad in turn. But from the Greek standpoint and from a pose of inquiring into the psychological workings of time, we might ask why indeed Greek myth in fact does not continue the cycle of divine son deposing dad, but rather stops here in an ongoing if not eternal present, with Zeus as the all-powerful fact of a godhead, not ever replaced by one of his own children. There are a series of answers to this question, but I want to bring in just one from Hesiod's Theogony, a, sor a sort of instance of kairos, to turn to Professor Hartog's second critical term. 
When Zeus overcomes his father Kronos, he induces him to vomit up the previously devoured siblings, whom fortunately I suppose he had not chewed up, um, as well as the stone that had been given to Kronos as a decoy for the baby Zeus himself. Zeus then takes this stone and places it at the crossroads of Pythia and Mount Parnassus, signifying the replacement of that quick-shifting past with an eternal, implacable present. For as Hesiod writes, that stone is still there. It is a sign, or a sema, thereafter, a wonder for mortal men. Its location at the crossroads of Pythia and Parnassus is significant, for this is a location that gestures to both the work of prophecy and poetry, which in ancient Greek culture were two ways of seeing, and this is a quote, the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that shall come to be. The stone then becomes a symbol, a sema, of the interlocking of these multiple time frames. Professor Hartog writes in his book of Greek time as double time, that is, one time that is immortal, unchanging time, and another that is transitory human time. And though this is broadly correct, I would suggest that ancient Greek culture also shows a concern with finding a present that might unite these two kinds of time, bringing humans into an ongoing chronos that is less defined by its past than we might otherwise be led to believe. This interpretation then would suggest that the effort Professor Hartog attributes to early Christian authors to see the past as mere prefiguration of the future was in some ways already in play for pre-Christian Greek people. <clears throat> My second comment links to a different thread of Professor Hartog's argument. Turning to Anaximander, an early Greek philosopher, Professor Hartog finds that justice, which in Greek is decay, is said to play out according to the order of time, to chrono taxon. As Professor Hartog writes, here we find the earliest indication of a cyclical time that renders a judgment. A link between time and justice would contribute, after many centuries, to the notion of history as the world's tribunal, though from Anaximander to Hegel extends the whole of Christianity's temporal mechanism, culminating in the final judgment. So one question I have for Professor Hartog is what makes this time cyclical, per se? But perhaps you can take that up later. But more than that, I want to probe the links that he builds between time and justice, which is a topic that I find fascinating. Here, in part, I am gesturing toward Professor Hartog's addition of a third term to the dyad of Kronos and Kairos, which is Croesus. Croesus is not itself a temporal word, he notes. In Greek, it means something like trial or decision, or even just the act of separating or picking apart. As such, it is well posed to stand in for the Christian idea of apocalypse, the great instant of decision that is from one angle an ending, and from another, simply an interruption of all this and something else that we cannot see. The part that I want to pick up on is the more human piece the kinds of justice that are fabricated or created by people to imagine or extend into a future of our own creation. And here I was particularly taken by Professor Hartog's interpretation of Adolf Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem in 1961, and some of his attendant comments on the role of memory in time. Professor Hartog suggests first that the Nuremberg trials in 1945-46, which aimed to hold leading Nazis accountable for their war crimes, quote, set Kronos time marching again into the future, or at least that was the hope." End quote. This was meant to be transitional justice, part of an effort to reframe the terrible present as merely the terrible past, and set ourselves marching into the future. But this version of time, Hartog suggests, was quickly overtaken by, quote, the time that issued from Auschwitz, a halted time, a past that went nowhere, a prolonged present. He continues, the existence of crimes against humanity creates a temporality until then unheard of, a time that does not advance. And this is explicit, as there is no statute of limitations for the crime committed. Judicial time, which typically limits the period within which litigants may lodge a suit, does not advance." End quote. This kind of judicial time, far from marking a transition, halts it and locks us into an ongoing, rather nightmarish present tense, what he has called presentism. Professor Hartog further links this kind of judicial time to memory, but importantly does not see memory as being of a piece with history. He writes, quote, while presentism has given up on history, it depends on memory, which is effectively an extension of the present into the past, as moments of the past are evoked and collected in the present. Memory then makes us coeval with our crimes. Memory is the time, he adds, of the victim. So for what it's worth, the Greeks had an idea of this too, though differently, of course. Reaching beyond Anaximander to tragedy, we find human time and divine time coalescing once more, 
And here I must depart from Professor Hartog's view of tragedy, which she calls, quote, explorations of a place without Kairos time, a world where characters are always out of sync, their relation to time unsettled. In this view of tragedy, I believe that Professor Hartog does not take account of the links that are constructed between human and divine time. Recall that for humans in the epic Theogony, a conjoining of time is marked by a stone placed by Zeus at a significant crossroads of prophecy and poetry. For humans in tragedy, a link to divine time is created by the idea of justice itself, which is often configured in Aeschylean tragedy as a tablet on which the truth is written. This tablet at times is imagined as existing in the minds of gods, or even as being the mind of a god. This imagined tablet is in fact not unlike our modern idea of memorials. It is a stone, a physical thing, on which the facts, names, and deeds of the past are written down, and through which the deeds of the past continue to have meaning in the present. In Aeschylus's view in the Oresteia, for example, such a memorializing of the past is key to the acts of transformation that must also take place in order to bring the present into the future. Judicial time, then, is meant to transform the present from past into the future, if not in the apocalyptic terms of Christianity. Finally, Professor Hartog ends his book by inquiring into how our growing understanding of the Anthropocene and the age of the planet and our experience of COVID, which comes at the very end, have shaken up the pieces of time as we understand them. Here is a new Kronos, one that threatens like Father Kronos to swallow the present, one that we have ourselves launched but cannot control, one in which we bear a great deal of accountability and yet diminishing agency. The future is back, Professor Hartog suggests, but this future does not belong to us. Thank you, Sarah. Then I think we go to Professor Zebovic. Um, I see I'm the only one who doesn't have a written text here. I feel a bit underdressed, like someone coming with shorts to a gala event. Um, with that, I wanted to thank very much Anna and Deepesh for uh, inviting me to, um, to comment here um, and say a few words about a beautiful, beautiful book. I'll say in, in the next few minutes, um, I'll say a few words about the book. I'm not going to try and frame, of course, or touch every single point, um, but I'll try to point out uh, two specific questions that I had um, uh, while reading the book. So first, uh, as a historian, um, let me frame or, or contextualize Professor Artog, who's one of the great historians of the last generation, uh, someone who, those of us who followed his many publications, um, extends and, and elaborates on the tradition of the Annal and the Col des Autitudes uh, in France, but who took a different turn somewhat to the um, ancient world um, and developed, used that in order to develop uh, um, a conceptual framework that I think really came to fruition with the last uh, two books that we have now luckily in English. Um, and, and at the center of both books, um, and, and Depeche and, and Francois already uh, talked about them, mentioned them in, um, uh, shortly, briefly, um, are the three concept of, of concepts of chronos, chaos, and crisis, which are extending in a chronological manner between the ancient, um, the, the chronos side, the Christian, the chaos side, and crisis, which belongs to modernity um, um, in very broad terms. But of course, the, the point that uh, Francois Altog is trying to, to tell us is that actually all three can be arranged in different, in different ways in each of those periods. So the, the, um, um, the emphasis actually falls differently in each of those uh, periods. Um, these are three, as he calls them, operative concepts and they're framed within uh, a more a broad uh, notion of the regime of historicity, which is, he says, a way to link, to tie past, present, and future uh, in different degrees, in different measures, um, which in his eyes extends or goes beyond Kozelek's notion that history belongs to modernity. So here we have concepts that actually are borrowed since ancient times and allow us in, in a time that actually extends now beyond modernity to reframe modernity as part of, of, um, of a certain order or regime of uh, temporality. So we have a, a historical temporality of, uh, of time, really, of, of temporal concepts. In that sense, regime of historicity, the, the notion of regimes of historicity goes beyond, and I'm curious if uh, Francois would agree with me, beyond ideological divisions 
between conventions and meta-narratives that we're used to think about when we think about modernity, which doesn't mean that uh, the perspective here is not, uh, is lacking of perspective. And the perspective here um, is one of the, I would argue, following Sarah's beautiful comment, uh, the, the Christian emphasis on, on Kairos that um, is extending and being internalized within modernity um, and within secularization. And I'll say uh, a word about that and, and ask a question about that as well. Um, Modernity in that respect is a form of internalization and reworking, much like and in parallel to secularization, of the Christian kairos, um, or the notion that the kairos is, is moving towards its fulfillment, right? And, and I'll say a word about kairos. Um, I thought Sarah would actually mention that, but I'll, I'll say two words about how it's being um, uh, read by historians of, of classicism um, and the ancient world. Uh, briefly, who are not Fonsoir, and then I'll say something about Fonsoir. So, um, James Kinevy, uh, Lee Holden, and, and Mario Untersteiner, among others, are talking about Kairos, the concept of Kairos, as the opportune moment or the right measure. And Fonsoir um, and Giorgio Agamben, those of you who follow uh, political philosophy, talk about it as the time of the now or the right time, the right moment, which extends between the arrival of the Messiah, Christ, and the end of the time. So be the beginning of the end of the time and the, the actual end of the time, right? And that's chaos. And the point of chaos is that it, it needs to be fulfilled. It's realized at the end of time where we have parousia, where we have the revival, and where time comes to an end with redemption, right? And that's an eschatological uh, form of thinking about, about time. Kinevy explains chaos um, as inherently linked to a form of harmonization of temporal concepts or the worldview that has to do with time. Um, he says that, um, the, using the peri keru, the, the notion of keros builds on the right moment in time, which um, is attaching or affiliated with a situation. So we learn how to actually see temporal concepts in relation to what historical uh, circumstances uh, allow us and must interpret them through that perspective, through that prism. In that respect, the regime of historicity reads the right time um, through, that, um, um, uh, through that prism. L. L. Wellborn, another classicist, is warning us, though, that looking at chaos um, only as a harmonic form actually misses the militant, militant potential of it. And he says the following, that um, as we read through St. Paul, um, who's the, the one that really frames chaos at the center of his epistles, we see chaos actually um, 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 diluted or, or moving out in favor of something else. Um, he says, actually, if we read the, the epistle to the Romans, the, the last epistles, um, we see that, that in fact, um, Parousia is disappearing, and what we have instead is a militant community of awakening selves. A militant community of awakening selves replacing redemption in some ways, um, which sounds to me, and I don't know if people um, think about the same thing, like a group of zombies, and I mean that in a more, in a more serious way, actually. It's not just a joke. Um, so our talk's notion of regime of historicity is thinking about the, the process or the mechanism of internalizing chaos into modernity and warns us that in modernity we come to, and he explained that in the concept of presentism, we come to identify the fulfillment of modernity with short-term gain, that is capitalism, right? And the notion that capitalism will redeem us, um, or in the words of Frederick Jameson, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, right? Um, and but, but that doesn't stop here. So the book actually takes us one step further, and that is, I guess, why all of us are here. And that is trying to imagine time from the perspective of the Anthropocene, or what comes after modernity. And here, Francois is warning us that the, um, the Anthropocene comes somewhat after the, the time has been, been fulfilled. And I'll read a quote from page 217, those of you who want to check the, the, uh, the book. Chronos time, which now is, the, is um, pulled out from ancient time and comes back into the Anthropocene to actually reframe the chaos that led to modernity. So chronos time, limitless and bottomless, 
has abruptly imposed boundaries on the world time. This is the greatest of the Anthropocene shocks. Looking back, Kronos had, had freed itself from the grip of chaos, chaos and crisis, and crisis, after a long struggle with the interlocking end of time and time of the end, so again, the, the notion of, of, um, of chaos being fulfilled, those Caesar's blades that constitute um, the Kronos time. So in other, the Christian time, I'm sorry, not Kronos time, the Christian time. Uh, the, the Caesar's blades that constitute the Christian time. So Kronos comes back with a vengeance, we can say, to actually restructure a notion of deep time that is both deep past but also deep future. And with that, I want to ask Francois to maybe um, respond to two quick questions about it. First, I thought when I thought about the title for the, my short commentary, I thought that uh, the revenge of Kronos actually would be the most fitting here. And I hope you understand now the logic behind that. Um, Kronos, in that sense, uh, comes to replace Kairos and comes to replace um, history as we know it or as we thought we knew it. Um, from Jesus to the present, basically, um, to the moment of the Anthropocene. So in that sense, we have with Kronos, actually, maybe a different form of redemption, eschatological redemption or redemption in other, Christian redemption in other means. And the book is actually anti-Christian in, in that sense, but I want to, to ask whether maybe you secularize, you use Kronos to secularize the Christian eschatological um, uh, discourse. A second question is, um, how, from that perspective, do we actually understand non-Christian time? So from the perspective of someone who's doing mostly Jewish or German-Jewish history um, and dealing with the, uh, the failure of emancipation and assimilation, or as we discussed uh, in a seminar, the imperfectability um, that Europeans expect indigenous populations to actually, the perfectability they expect and, and the imperfectability when the indigenous population fail to fulfill right, the expectation of, of Christians, of Europeans. Um, maybe there's something about that notion of chaos between the already we talked about and the not yet, the, the in German, the, the schon and the uh, noch nicht, right? Uh, between the already of the arrival of, the, of, of Christ the first time and then the not yet of his parousia, of the revival, that the Jews actually, um, the, the German Jewish, Jewish thinkers, such as Arendt, of course, talk about in negative terms, that is the already not leading to the not yet, right? And the already not and the not yet are politicized. So the point is to see things from the perspective of post-destruction, not post-messianic time, and, over, and the not yet as the not yet politics of the imperfectability of the European culture and, and Christianity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then Bill Brown from the English Department. Great. Um, uh, first off, thanks, Anna, for getting this all organized. Um, uh, Francois, thank you for this book, uh, which I really enjoyed. But I'd really like to begin by thanking Depeche for his invitation to serve as a respondent. Uh, history is not my field. And uh, nonetheless, as you yourself and as Francois make clear, uh, history is my problem or better, our problem. Um, and I want to thank Francois for, um, for Kronos, that extraordinary uh, book, a history that dramatizes the many ways in which historian are not time is my problem, it's your problem, um, and it's our problem. As we struggle to orient ourselves in a knot of temporalities as we inhabit foremost and foregrounded in the closing pages of your book, the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous, the coexistence of two incommensurable temporalities, the time of the world and the time of the earth, what, Francois, you call at one point the narrow time of the world and Anthropocene temporality. So let me begin with that phrase, the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous, since it's impossible for me, and I'm sure for most of us, um, hearing that phrase, not to hear its deployment by Ernst Bloch, subsequently by Harry Haratunian and others, the, contemporane the contemporaneity of the non-contemporaneous or the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous, depending on the translation, that was meant to caption and to help conceptualize the uneven onset of modernization in the experience of modernity. I'm struck by how, 
facing the crisis of climate change, that non-contemporaneity may well have subsided. It may be obsolete in one respect. Um, an all but global recognition, I'm going to try to tune that up in a minute, um, or confrontation with uh, the time of the Earth, which is to say the time that will extend beyond the extinction of mankind, uh, beyond our time. So your book addresses the West, you know, in a, the West, <laughs> um, uh, confronting time. And certainly, one of the great epiphanies, uh, which I use lightly, not heavily, one of the great epiphanies one has reading the book and traveling, as it were, from the Christian crises of time to the modern uh, crises of time and the contemporary, perhaps post-presentist, crisis of time is the resurging effectiveness in our present of Augustine's bifurcating codification of the Christian regime of historicity, city of God, city of man. Becoming Christian is learning to live in two incommensurable temporalities in the eternity of God, which is by definition off limits, unquestionable, the unrepresentable, and in ordinary, and at the same time, in ordinary chronos time. Such an epiphany, that is the epiphany of Augustine's ongoing relevance, comes to full fruition uh, not in your own analogy, which you both offer and take back at a, at a, uh, in a key paragraph in this book. Um, it's an analogy, but I'm not taking that seriously, but nonetheless it's an analogy. Uh, but it comes to full fruition, really, in your utterly brilliant brief reading of Bruno Latour's Facing Gaia. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry that Bruno is no longer with us. Uh, but despite his rhetoric, you say, despite Bruno's rhetoric, borrowed from the French Revolution, the Christian already and not yet hover in the background, but transformed, as you say, into the already and again. The end time has come, I'm quoting now, the end time has come, yes, but it goes on. There is indeed the feeling of a radical break, but the break must constantly be taken up again. That's quoting Latour. After his countless, now I'm quoting you, Francois, after his countless assertions and turns of phrase, the final result is without question a present cast as Kairos time and a plea for a new presentism that may not be Christian but belongs to the Christian type. Uh, so if you'll forgive me for like leaping over your many engagements with the likes of the Abbot of Fiore, um, all, all of which, and I learned so much from this book, but if you'll forgive me for leaping out over all of that, uh, the figures of Paul, Augustine, and Latour locate us squarely in the West. And yet, such bifurcated temporality cannot not be felt by anyone, which is to say everyone, who experiences the flooding, the drought, and the fire that accompany climate change. So can this be understood as a globalization not affected by or not just affected by capital, by the digital revolution, uh, but by an ethical conscious, your or consciousness to borrow Depeche's notion, borrowed from Jasper's, um, not globalization maybe, but planetization, that the effects of which are certainly unevenly experienced, I'm thinking of like Pakistan, but the fact of which might be, cannot not be shared, however unconsciously. Right. Um, by this I mean nothing more than the shared sense uh, that which is coming of that that which is coming will arrive, not unexpectedly, everyone knows it's coming, but in unexpected ways and often at unpredictable times. So can you imagine a new internalized anthropocentric regime of historicity that is global? And by this, I mean, I'm not thinking, Depeche, in your terms of a consciousness of um, the human as species, but I am thinking of something like a phenomenological coming to consciousness of the planetary um, because, oh my God, um, I, I don't have any more water, right? Um, and I'm actually imagining that as it were, as a, like a, like a, a benefit of climate change, something that's, that's not quite capital, that's not quite the digital, that nonetheless um, might give one um, some purchase on this kind of thinking. Um, a, uh, and a shared kind of thinking. Uh, so that was sort of point one. Um, so one could say um, that the term Anthropocene is, is a scientific and widely deployed cultural rubric, as you certainly point out. Call it an analytic, an optic, an aperture. 
that allows us to name and to focus on the impact of the world on the Earth. The brief time before the extinction of humankind on Earth, when humankind will have transformed the Earth, which will itself persist. And so if we're grappling with two temporalities that never mix, I'm quoting, isn't it actually a mixture, a mixture that gives us the concept of the Anthropocene in the first instance? And I think I hear something of this point when you write that negotiating between an immense time and our own ephemeral time, we confront gigantic differences in temporal scales, but we are not confronting divergent temporalities. So doesn't the term Anthropocene also uh, shed light, even a glimmer of light, on the much longer simultaneity of world and earth, although that simultaneity never came into consciousness. So the, the time of the world and the time of the earth have in some sense always been the same time. It's just when do they get recognized as that. Um, so then finally, if I may indulge in a little history, um, uh, use my memory, um, therefore um, uh, wax autobiographical. Way back in the 1980s, I was a graduate student who was uh, helping to organize a conference sponsored by the Stanford Humanities Center uh, titled uh, Chronotypes, the Construction of Time. So we had great people. We had Johannes Fabian and Gayatri Spivak and Dominic Lacapra, um, also Bas von Frossen, um, the philosopher of science. And he began his talk on the morning of the second day by standing up and telling the audience that Physics cannot determine the time exists. In your book, uh, Carlo Rovelli plays that role, uh, pointing out how quantum physics disintegrates our notion of time, which is to say how it disintegrates time. Right. So at the conference from the 1980s, there was sort of, there were people giggled, in fact, when, um, when Bas van Frossen said, mm, physics tells us mm, no time. Um, uh, so, but it strikes me that uh, those claims, Rivelli's claim, Boston Frossen's claim, other people's, you might even say a, a version of Aristotle's, um, should be highlighted and highlighted again and again because it's the non-existence of time that clearly underlies its fabrication and refabrication and manipulation, if you will. Hence the futurism of the modern regime of historicity where time becomes not a medium but an agent or the current triumph of Kronos time in presentism champion of the now, dismisser of duration, and of the future. I'm quoting. Uh, the space assigned to the future by the presentism of the last decades has been meager. A time of urgency and acceleration, of rushing, of a hunger for technological innovation, tender notices, super fast returns on investments. If I have a figure for um, our ongoing presentism, that version of presentism, it's Bitcoin consuming more energy annually than Argentina and generating 65 megatons of carbon dioxide annually. Uh, so you ask, so now I'm really just asking you the questions that you ask. Between the Anthropocene and the age of the microprocessor, what sort of historical time or new historical time is possible? How do we resist the new urgency, um, the, what you call the pathology um, of our present? Uh, and so in this conceptual uh, history, this book, which is so much more than a conceptual history, uh, you repeatedly quote um, Alexis de Tocqueville. I'm saying that as we say that in American English. Uh, when the past no longer lights up the future, the spirit walks in darkness. So I'm wondering how you might share with us a sense of um, on a, some moment of, the, of disorientation, you point one out here, um, where in fact um, history and futurity will shed light um, on one another. I mean, in part, it's the question, what is to be done? I mean, of course, you write a book like this. That's, that's doing a lot, right? But how do we then um, disseminate that illumination? Thank you, Will. So the last comments are, as you can see, we started from with a classicist and went to a historian, a lit theorist. And the last comments are from an anthropologist, Stefan Pamir, who couldn't be here. So I'll just read them out. 
and then it's over to you, Francois, for a few comments. And before we open up, and this is Stefan Pamir, I'm reading him. Kronos is a dazzling achievement. No surprise here, at least for those of us familiar with Francois Hartog's previous work. His delineation of changing textures and tilloi of Western time is a genuine tour de force. From the Christian configurations of the Greek trifecta, Kronos, Kairos, and Chrysalis, to the discovery of synchronicity, the protracted secularization of time, the all too brief reign of the modern regime of historicity, to the dissolution presentism of the second half of the 20th century, and on to the catastrophic intrusion of geological into worldly time and the temporalities of COVID lockdown. This is meta history at its best. Much of this is far beyond my ken, but I would like to offer some observations about what anthropology might have to contribute to the endeavor and task that our guest has laid out for us. I won't go into the terrible history of the syndrome that Johannes Fabian once characterized as the de denial of coevalness to our non-Western contemporaries, except to say that Francois Hartog's account of the extension of a Christian calendar throughout the waning Roman Empire, or the clock time of its aftermath, ought to be complemented by ethnographies of how temporal regimes associated with Christian definitions of the current dispensation entered non-Western life worlds. Armed with Durkheimian conceptions that so radically challenged Kantian a priori, Evans Pritchard's 1934 delineation of newer ecological, or ecological and structural time is a good example. Nothing Julian, or for that matter, Gregorian, about this. But some 70 years later, Sharon Hutchinson took a photograph of a newer prophet conversing on his cell phone. In real time, as we have become wont to say, complete with date and timestamp. Surely the man was neither a convert to Christianity or Islam for that matter, but his phone would have registered the call in what, after Benjamin, some of our colleagues have come to call empty homogeneous time. Anthropologists have long worried about such issues, yet if time was once an abstract category to be studied in its diverse cultural refractions, it has now become a worldly one not just different cultures, different historicities, as Marshall Salins once put it, but emergent layers of partly hybridized, sometimes positively contradictory orders of time, and their experiential affordances and aporia in the West itself. If Hutton and Lyle's geological uniformitarianism and Darwinian evolution shut the coffin of Bishop Usher's short biblical chronology, Deep geological chronos nonetheless coexisted with its chirotic rivals. Think here of Philip Henry Goss's argument that God had played fossils in the earth to test our faith, published a year after Darwin's Origin of Species. But when such 19th century episodes of pushback against the increasingly all pervasive machinic chronos of science and industrial capitalism, a bit of a replay, structural transformation of the Renaissance humanist struggle to reconcile Christian time with pagan antiquity. How mightily Scalinger labored in the vineyard of synchronisms. What ingenuity of La Pierre to suggest that Genesis is merely about the Jews, so we can leave the rest of the time to the pre-Adamites. By the time of Buffon and Condorcet, it had all become love's labor lost. Bakhtin's notion of the chronotope has had this considerable influence in ethnographic forms of inquiry into the experience of time for a while now. And I was a bit surprised that the Russian theorist doesn't make an appearance in Hartog's book. Figurative typology is, of course, a marvelous machine for churning out chronotope after chronotope, the present as the chirotic fulfillment of the past, which only now becomes comprehensible in a moment of retrospective mutual illumination. Eric Auerbach has written lucidly about the afterlife of typology. And there are nice ethnographic examples, such as Courtney ha Handman's work on how the ministrations of the Summer Institute of Linguistics brought Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea's guhus samane, to understand themselves as ancient Israelites, fulfilling the promise of conversion. The SIL, 
that is the Summer Linguist Institute of Linguistics itself, of course, typologically aims to undo the unfortunate incidents at the Tower of Babel by engineering a new fa future Pentecost, heaping typolo typological chronotope upon typological chronotope. Nonetheless, might not the belated discovery of the conceptual utility of Bakhtin's chronotope in the social sciences be a mere symptom of the progressions in the late 20th century experience of time that Hartog lays out? What I mean is that the very switch from cultural refractions of real time to different regimes of historicity in which time is experienced and becomes discursively available, this switch has a history, our history. I find it useful to rethink such matters in the categories provided by the early Oxford post-structuralist Edwin Ardiner. In a series of famous cryptic essays published in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Ardiner laid out a theory of what he called the prophetic condition. Like Hartog's prophets, Ardenas don't foretell the future at all. What they do is to put the present under a hitherto uh, ineffable description. The precondition for the prophetic condition to arise is a phenomenon that Ardner calls the parameter collapse, within which he, with a nod to medieval, medieval English mysticism, turns, quote, the fuzzy cloud of unknowing that is a society's image of its world structure, unquote. What does he mean by world structure? What, does, what by parameter collapse? Without descending too far into Adner's thought, let me just say that a world structure is a historically unstable mix of language and materiality, largely discursively available to its inhabitants, except as a result of routine guesswork that yields what Adner calls language shadows of the real thing, Note here the, emergence, the convergence with St. Augustine's conundrum. These shadows are calibrated along routinized axes of mensuration. Um, so I'm just skipping a little bit here. The prophetic condition, says Adner, obtains when the qualitative values in accordance with which routine quantifications are set begin to diverge to such a degree as to render the latter apparatic patently mismatching a given space of experience with this accustomed horizon of expectation. Prophecy, in that sense, is a novel language that puts an anomic present under a hitherto unthinkable predication, and so, however fuzzily aligns a changing world structure with the language shadows of it that currently happen to be in circulation. So last pair. Does this fit contemporary climate discourse? I think it does. For a frivolous example, think of Greta Thunberg as a typological fulfillment of Chief Seattle. The real Elijah 2.0, neurodiversity and all. Or think of the fact that Harper's Dictionary has just made the linguistic monstrosity. The Harper's Dictionary has just made the linguistic monstrosity, permacrisis, permacrisis, the word for the year 2022. More seriously, however, I think we are experiencing a situation of parameter collapse in the ordinarian sense, and our host, Dipesh, oh, okay, has, draw, has driven this home most forcefully. As Hartog sums up the matter, no longer will the planet's time serve as a mere prop in our self-crypted productions played on the world's time, unquote. Once more, we are living in two times. It seems only that the Earth system time has taken the place vacated by God. No accommodation here. The end of times is no longer thinkable, but the time of the end may well be on the horizon for our species and much of the rest of the world as we have known it. But Dipesh is no prophet. Thank God I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in the language of our current world, he may be the Saint John the Baptist. <laughs> OK, I hadn't read this before. <laughs> he may be the St. John the Baptist to herald a new historical dispensation. But what, will this, what this will be, we don't know. Of course, the historian's job is to deliver only retrodictive verdicts. Minerva's owl flies at dusk. But I'm curious to hear, and that's not an empirical question, of course, whence our guest thinks that truly prophetic language might ring forth now. From where? So, look, uh, we've had the discussions. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> and so, Francois, a few quick remarks, and then we open it up.
Okay? They've been very patient, most of the people here. And Francois, bring the microphone. Please. Very close to you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um. <coughs> well, <coughs> first of all, of course, many oh, sorry, sorry, can you hear him at the back? Uh, yeah. You can, but not at the very back, right? Very far back. Okay, Francois, either speak louder or bring it closer. <coughs> That would be better. And hold it close to you, yeah. like singers do. Uh, okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you to all of you, and thank you for Stephen uh, Panier, who, uh, who is present through these uh, prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, of course, I cannot. Uh, and take into uh, account and was you all the things which have been said about Kronos by each of you. Uh, but because what you said are um, quite often things of which I've, I did not, uh, uh, they were not there in my, in my plan, in my work. And so you, bring uh, questions, materials, ideas, which um, I have to reflect upon in order to see whether it would have been good or not to put them in my argument. Uh, probably not all, because I had to make the choice. I had to be very selective. Uh, to to follow my my thread, uh, which was this in a way the adventure of the three concepts, and there uh, from Kronos, Kairos, Crisis up to today, and how they have been uh, formulated, they have been transmitted, they have been reorganized, they have been um, reappropriated. And of course, they have been uh, uh, translated, and also uh, um, they have been, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, in a way, tried, mm, uh, um, mm? betrayed, betrayed. Right. Okay. Um, what you said about those um, and who? And that's why it has to do with uh, the, the question of uh, um, memory of question. Of, uh, all what you said about the stone seems to me very, very um, pertinent. And uh, but why? So you have this uh, Chronos, Chronos, which we who are not the same, and we are no um, link between the two. But nevertheless, there was one, and already in the ancient world. I mean, that's not an invention of the modern, it was already there. And, uh, but the logic of the Kronos, the, the god, and the Kronos time belongs, uh, are quite different. Because Kronos, with capital K, is, takes place in what the Greeks name called the, or what the modern called myths of sovereignty, sovereignty. That's the, uh, that's the installation of the order of Zeus. And uh, uh, this order, and we read easier in our class, you rem remember, um, this order is uh, presented by easier as forever. That's the order of Zeus, and nothing, no one can escape from uh, this order, this new order. And there is one, and one explanation given by uh, Ezeon. It's because Zeus, to avoid the same uh, and this destiny, <laughs> bad destiny, which uh, his father, uh, what, did he what did he do? 
he swallowed Metis, the, the go goddess of the, this uh, intelligence, uh, Kenny intelligence. And uh, mm -hmm. so he had from then on the capacity to see in advance. To, so nothing, nobody can um, surprise him for forever. Okay, so that's the, the mythical explanation of this uh, uh, situation. Um, what you said about uh, justice and time is also quite re absolutely relevant. And when you go from the Greek to, and I'm, I'm going to, so <laughs> from the Greek to uh, Nuremberg trial and, and uh, Auschwitz, I, I think that we have in Actually, we have two different times. The time of the trial was well, the first expression without the, the name of a transitional justice, which was uh, quite something uh, quite uh, regular uh, after that, afterward. But the first example of uh, transitional justice, that is, in a way, the the, the aim is to be able to start again. The, the time starts again. Okay. That's Nuremberg trial. Except that you had the, 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 the crime against humanity, which was there and was uh, recognized as uh, legal incrimination. And the, the time against humanity, we spoke of that recently, the time against humanity uh, introduced an un, uh, absolutely new, unprecedented time. That is a time which does not pass. Because the ordinary, the, as you know, the ordinary time of justice is prescription. And in the crime against humanity, there is no prescription. It's imprescriptible. And that means th that, in a way, time stops as long as the criminal is alive. <coughs> so we have this. And if in the beginning, uh, Nuremberg was uh, the main uh, uh, point of <coughs> reference in the around this with the <coughs> with Aus with um, uh, the trial of um, with, with the Eichmann trial in 1961, the time of Auschwitz became more and more prominent. François. I have to go. As the, <coughs> as the yeah, keeper of time, no. I have, a, I have a suggestion. Pas I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pas sorry. Pas sorry. Mm. So we have about 18 minutes left. Okay, I stop. So I was just thinking <coughs> if we took some questions from the audience and then you can come back to what you had to say to Nick. Is that all right? Oh, well, yeah. Choose your question you want to answer. Is, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Then that, that's what we'll do then. Uh, so we'll take some questions from, from you and then Francois can come back to. <coughs> Responding to Nitsan and, and, and Bill. Yeah, Prothoma. Prothoma, actually, the thing is, you, you have a microphone coming to you. So, because it's being recorded. So, so this is um, great uh, diversity of perspectives to the table. I'll just put another two questions. Of justice, the, the wrongs of the past 
You want to respond? Yeah. No. Uh, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to wait? Take another question and then respond. Well, let's take another question and then respond. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Um, Thomas, wait for the microphone. Uh, Now, the time coming of Connor primarily 
Francois, maybe you can come in now and also respond to Bill and Nitsan and the question <laughs> uh, on the uh, um, Quickly, all quickly, and then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Of course. Uh, uh, the question about. Um, well, come on, come on and start with the expiration and the ending. Yeah, there is there is a difference, of course. <coughs> and and um, ending as a meaning, if we remain in this more or less uh, Christian world, okay, with the uh, apocalypse at the end and the, the judgment more or less, what kind of I mean, judgment may be of different kind, but you have this uh, uh, perception, at least. Well, and it's clear that um, apocalypse does not mean anything for a Chinese, and for an Indian, neither. Okay. So uh, that's, that's already a big difference. And, and um, exp uh, so expiration, it's d that's a, another, from another point of view, and it's clear that uh, which is at, at stake is not the ex expiration of time, it's the ending of a certain form of, of time. Okay. Um, about the presentism and um, uh, victims, um <coughs> I think that uh, the the coming at the forefront of, vic of the victims, which starts also with the uh, uh, Eichmann trial, um, has something to do, and I it's, uh, we, have to, we have to be cautious, but has something to do with the surge of presentism. <coughs> I'm, I'm not saying that victims are necessarily presentist, but this, uh, uh, when future was uh, running, victims were left behind. They were not allowed to speak because the, the telos was the the goal where you have to go, whether it would be in a nation or whatever, and the victims start to <coughs> rise uh, when this perception, when this dimension of the future uh, diminishes, and when uh, the future is losing its strength, so to speak. <coughs> um, about, 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 uh, perhaps a few words, um, which goes, we are, um, Stefan and <coughs> Bill, um, they introduced, um, with Bakhtin and the chronotopes, for example, or the development of uh, Stefan with uh, other uh, forms of time and other places, uh, uh, starting with uh, Fabian uh, uh, work. <coughs> yes, of course, that's important. But I, th I think that my, as my goal was to try to remain in this uh, furrow, so to speak, of the, of the three concepts. And of course, doing that, I can give the impression that I think that's the only way to, to deal wi with time, or that's this, uh, uh, it's a way to put aside other temporalities or way of, or way of organizing. No, that's not the case. That's only to, s to see uh, how far this uh, specific organization of time through the three concepts play an important role even much later, even after the Christian regime has 
lost his uh, strength and, as you said, is uh, inserting itsel itself inside the modern time. And I try to, sh mm, to follow the way in which, for example, Kairos was recycled, in a way, uh, in the modern time in order, for example, to try to grasp what is a revolution. And that's, of course, that's what the case for the French Revolution. Either you see it as a kairos, that is even, or perhaps even the kairos with a capital K, or you can see also the revolution as a crisis with a capital K. That is the final crisis and the counter-revolutionary were exactly on this line. And the modern historiography with Labrousse mostly uh, <coughs> in the 20th century uh, try to demonstrate very precisely, accurately that the revolution was the outcoming of a whole series of different crises. Miss crisis with mini minuscule, <laughs> okay? So, crisis is still there, but you can modu modulate, so to speak, uh, the, the concept of crisis, and you can put it in the, in the service of, of Kronos, so to speak. We have time for one or two more questions, if anybody has any. <coughs> Then I'll, I'll just return to something Bill said, which is what also I, where I felt, uh, I kind of got, the, got a particular insight from reading your book, which is your, your analysis of Latour as an apocalyptic thinker. And Bill also pointed out, yeah, and, and what, what that explained to me was, at least your line of thinking explains to me why there is more alarmism, catastrophism, and apocalyptic thinking going on in the West. Now, all that may be reasonable. I mean, but I just don't come across the same kind of alarmism in India or China who might be facing as many problems. And, and I thought the book kind of at least give, illuminates that problem. At least you give, give me one way of thinking about it, which is the influence of secularized but yet apocalyptic. And Bruno actually uses the word apocalypse. And what you point out, I've seen you know, humorously, I mean, you point out that Bruno is a heretic apocalyptic thinker because he thinks that by talking about apocalypse, he'll inspire people to avoid it and live through it and beyond it, right? So, right. So, and I thought, uh, Bill pointed that out, but I thought that's, uh, yeah. Well, if there are no more urgent questions, are if anybody on the panel, do you have any closing thoughts? Bill, Nitsan, Sarah? No. I would just say this is going back to the victim question a little, but it's also going back to my question about um, the ubiquity of the problem, right? So um, you do such a good job here of bracketing the non West. So this is about the West, right? Um, but I was just wondering oh, well, outside the confines of this book, um, would you imagine that there might be um, some uh, moment where, uh, you know, an internalized uh, notion of uh, crisis, small c, planetary crisis, um, actually effectively unites the world? Unites the world. Yeah. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that sense, and um, Anthropocene can be seen as a Kairos. No. Mm -hmm. That is perhaps the last occasion yeah. to try to do something like that. Not on a, an apocalyptic mode, but on a secular meaning of Kairos, if you want. But, uh, mm -hmm. but that's not the way we are uh, following, it seems to me. Um, I'll say 
maybe um, just in response to the question about uh, uh, victims and in response to, to Francois's uh, last comment, which is I think there's, um, and also Deepesh, that, that there is something about the, the and there, there is a lot of discussion about the Eichmann trial and the Nuremberg trials, specifically the, the Eichmann trial, the way that it's actually being performed, right? So the time of, of, of the victim in that sense is also the time of, of performing the function of the victim within the, the modern uh, politics of post-1945. I think that maybe helps to, to shed some light on that notion, that transformation. And one thing we did discuss before was the fact that transitional justice in that form is, is always retroactive, right? So there's another temporality from within the legal discourse that actually enters here into the, the game and actually changes um, that, that flow of, of the, the different times, the chronos chaos and, and crisis. Thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end of this evening. Thank you all very much. It's, it's obvious that um, François Hartog has written a very thought-provoking, fascinating and original and interesting book, which doesn't answer all our questions, but definitely gives insights into, um, into our current condition and gives a long historical, uh, through the long sort of historical perspective uh, and illumination on it. So with that, thank, I thank very much my, my three uh, commentators and Stefan in his absentia, Francois for agreeing to this uh, panel on his book, and for all of you for being here and for your interest in the event. And again, to Anna and Three City and the Seminary Co-op, for organizing this. Thank you very much, and um, join me in. Thank you.